Uh, okay, for those who weren't here last time, this is Econ 172, uh, Issues in African Economic Development. I'm Ted Miguel uh, from the Econ Department, and uh, this is Lecture 2. I just want to spend five minutes very briefly recapping some of the admin stuff for those who weren't here last time, and just as a refresher, then we'll just continue discussing uh, what we got into uh, last time. So here's some just basic course information, my email and office hours, um, the GSIs uh, who introduced themselves last time and mentioned their office hours, and uh, the contact for any enrollment issues. I think even the last couple days, the wait list has shifted around. A number of people from the wait list have gotten enrolled in the class. Um, so hopefully some of those issues are kind of working themselves out, but if not, you know, if you're still having trouble, please contact Ginny um, and see you know, where, things, where things stand. Um, I spoke last time at some length about grading, and you know one aspect of grading that's a little different is this, this class participation grade. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And the one thing I just wanted to mention again is that uh, you guys should start bringing in your clickers on Tuesday, the iClickers. <coughs> and I'm hoping we'll have everything set up. Uh, the integration of iClicker with B courses is a little complicated. Uh, they just don't have it kind of worked out yet, but we will have it worked out by Tuesday. So please bring your iClicker, and I'll start you know posting uh, clicker questions on Tuesday. So you definitely want to uh, want to do that. And um, the lectures are going to be screencast with a one-week delay. Uh, but before that, if you want to see the slides, including the slides with my notes, they'll be posted right away after lecture. So I've already posted lecture one with the, the notes I took on the tablet. So um, you know that's a good way to go through the material after the after lecture. But then you'll be able to hear the lecture uh, a week later. Um, so we are still in week one, which I've highlighted there. We're going to talk about global patterns of development. Last time we started getting into uh, that discussion, including patterns of uh, you know, global poverty and income. And we're going to continue that discussion today and start zooming in on the African experience a little bit more. And then next week, we're going to turn to uh, some models of economic growth and try to uh, make our thinking about African development a little bit more uh, structured and systematic. OK, any questions about anything? Yeah, you know, I work on them. You know, I'm always trying to improve them. So like 10 minutes before lecture today, I was adding a new figure. And so it's just part of the process where I edit them right until the last point. If you do want to see a version of the slide that's similar, I've taught this class before. So for instance, last year's class, which had a different number, is 174. I think about 70 to 80% of the lectures are similar. Some are different. Those are posted, all the audio is on YouTube. Um, so you can see all those slides. I know they're not exactly the same, but they definitely will get you very familiar with material for maybe like three quarters of the lectures. Um, so that's, that's what I would point you to. But just because of my process of trying to improve the slides right up until the lecture, I, I don't post them in advance. Any other questions? All right, so um, let's just jump back where we were. We were talking about the world's major developing regions and focusing on the African uh, economic development experience, including some of these questions we're going to try to tackle in this course about where uh, Africa has been economically, where it's going, and why. Uh, and that's really going to be the organizing principle of the course. Now, um, in order to answer questions about why Africa's poor, what the right policies are for African development, as I mentioned last time, we're going to learn a whole range of econometric tools, models, and other things so we can tackle these issues uh, as rigorously as possible. Where we left off last time was with these two uh, maps. This was a map of world population, where country size is scaled uh, to world population. You can see Asia is really big. The US doesn't look so big. Africa is sort of somewhere in the middle. This is global population in 2011, so basically now. Um, but looking forward, and I'll show you more data on this during the course of the lecture, looking forward, the world map is going to change. So looking forward, if we fast forward, um, oh sorry, this is the GDP, and then I'll get to the population in a couple slides. This is world population. Asia's big, Africa's pretty big, the US and Europe are kind of in the middle. Once we look at GDP, North America is massive, Europe is massive, and Africa disappears. So this is really just a stark representation of the fact that Africa accounts for really a tiny share of global GDP, despite having a very large uh, population. And uh, you, know, you can really see why, if you read the Financial Times, or you read the Wall Street Journal, or others that are focused on the global economy, they're spending 95% of their time talking about North America, Europe, and a few countries in East Asia, because that's really where the bulk of global GDP is concentrated. Okay, so um, let's get into some of the patterns here. What we just had up there was GDP today, but GDP today is the result of past economic growth. So thinking about patterns of growth is going to be important. Um, the reason, there are a number of reasons why Sub-Saharan Africa is poorer than other regions today, but probably the most important uh, reason is since 1960, economic growth rates have been much lower in Africa than other developing regions. So for instance, economic growth rates in Asia have been much faster. When you compound that economic growth year after year, being faster in Asia over 50 years, 60 years, you get huge disparities in, uh, in income levels. Now, the positive side of this is that African growth rates have actually rebounded over the last decade or so. And we'll talk about uh, those patterns in detail in a couple minutes. So um, this slide is from an earlier report that the current uh, UNDP report that's on your syllabus actually doesn't have growth rates in a format that's useful for us. I pulled this from a report uh, from five or six years ago. Again, you see the breakdown into the different regions we talked about. And what I like here is they show the annual growth rate all the way over on the right from the mid-70s to about 2003. So it turns out this corresponds almost exactly to um, a period of very slow economic growth in Africa. So if you look at that column, I've highlighted sub-Saharan Africa, average per capita income growth was actually negative for Africa as a whole, negative 0.7 of 1%. That is terrible economic performance compared to these other developing regions. You can see, for instance, East Asia was 6% per capita growth. That's driven by China mainly, but some other East Asian countries. That's almost unprecedented, uh, unprecedentedly quick economic growth. South Asia, dominated you know, in terms of population by India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, have 2 to 3% per capita growth during this period. So not as fast as China, but still pretty fast growth. The rich countries, the so-called high-income OECD countries during this period, had about 2% growth. So even though India was going, growing pretty fast, they basically didn't really catch up to the rich countries that were growing at about the same, the same pace. So you know, poor countries have to grow at 2-something percent over this period just to sort of um, keep pace with the rich countries that are growing. Now, since 2003, rich country growth has actually been slower than 2.2%. Okay. Um, thinking about this over time is useful. So those are the averages. It's very useful to think of compounding year, year after year. So it turns out if you grow 6% a year for about 30 years, you grow a lot. So you know, even if it was just 6% times 30, we'd already be at you know, 180%. But of course, with compounding, growth rates, you know, overall growth is much larger. So over the course of that period, roughly 30 years, East Asian per capita growth of 6% per year translates into a quintupling of per capita income. And this is basically what happened in China. Just massive increases in per capita income. Now, even after that quintupling, China is way poorer than the rich countries. We, we showed last time that the rich countries are 40, 50 times richer than the poorest countries. So you know, even if you grow fivefold, that's only a start. You know, China would have to grow for another 50, 60 years at the levels they've seen to get close to rich country levels. So you know, there's still a huge gap, but, but they've started to narrow the gap. The problem with compounding is it also works if you have negative uh, compounding. So um, overall, per capita income in sub-Saharan Africa fell 18% over this period. 
So while some other regions, say in South Asia, they were doubling per capita income. In China, they were quintupling per capita income. In Africa, per capita income fell 18%. So it's just a staggering disparity between these different regions of the world. What are some other patterns that jump out at, at you uh, here in terms of the cross-regional comparisons? Is there anything else noteworthy in this, in this plot? Did I cover it all? Can't believe that. So you're saying like these guys are slowing down, but most of the developing regions are actually still growing pretty quickly. So you know overall, developing countries are growing faster, 2.9% instead of 2.3, and the rich countries are slowing down. So we're starting to see here, and this this trend has accelerated since 2003. The rich countries slowing down, the poor countries catching up, and sort of overall this imbalance between the traditionally very powerful, rich Northern European, North American countries and the rest of the world is narrowing. So we're starting to see some of that trend here. Yep. So there's other ways of looking at these trends beyond just per capita income. Another um, statistic that's of great interest is what's happening to extreme poverty in these different regions. So one way that extreme poverty is often measured is kind of arbitrary, but it sounds nice, which is the dollar a day poverty line. So if you think of per capita income of a dollar a day, that's really, really poor. And it turns out economists have looked at what a dollar buys you in poor countries. And in many poor, the part of the reason they chose this dollar a day um, threshold is in many poor countries, one dollar a day buys you sort of like just enough to eat and maybe get clothing. So it's, it's a subsistence level, roughly speaking. Um, if you're earning less than a dollar a day, you're really on the edge of survival. You're like the woman in Eritrea whose story we read last time, where any small shock to health or rainfall can just push you over the edge. So one dollar a day is seen as meaningful. If we look at, again, sub Saharan Africa, China, and India, again, we've been kind of comparing these three um, you know, regions where China and India are so large, they're basically you know, regions in their own right. Um, if you look at them in the 1980s, what do you see? Which of these three regions is poorest in terms of dollar a day poverty, meaning the proportion of population living on less than one dollar a day? It's actually China. Now, the data for China from the 1980s isn't great. There weren't representative household surveys. China was, you know, China still is an authoritarian dictatorship, but it was an even more totalitarian authoritarian dictatorship then. There was no free collection of data or uh, accountability. So we don't know if those numbers are good, but over time, the Chinese data gets better. Um, but those data probably are pretty accurate. When you look at China in the early 80s, they're basically coming off of uh, 50 years of, of Japanese invasion, civil war the Great Leap Forward, in which 20 million people starved to death, the Cultural Revolution. So some are foreign-imposed calamities, and some are self-imposed calamities, but basically 50 years of disaster, economic and political disaster by the 1980s. And by all accounts, China was extremely poor. Sub-Saharan Africa and India in the 80s have very similar levels of dollar a day poverty. 40% of the population is living on a dollar a day, or less. So just when you take these three regions together, between them, the majority of people in these regions are living on less than a dollar a day. That is just incredible poverty. But things start changing very rapidly, especially in China. So this is really you know, as the best evidence we can put our, get our hands on from, from data from these different regions, showing that Chinese dollar a day poverty in the 80s was probably somewhere between 40 to 70%. But by 2005, it's less than 10%. So there's very few people who are literally living on the edge of survival in China today. The reason why we haven't gone beyond 2005 is there just hasn't been, all the data hasn't been tabulated. To really measure this well, you need to get very detailed household level data of the kind we're going to talk about in this course. But you know, this will be updated. But the Chinese trend is really clear. The trend in India isn't quite as steep, but it's definitely the same trend. So dollar a day poverty in India goes from 40 something percent to 20 something percent and has continued to fall since then. So again, just massive reductions, basically one generation in extreme poverty in India and even more you know, pronounced in China. Sub-Saharan Africa, again here, doesn't do nearly as well. In fact, in the 80s and 90s, dollar a day poverty is rising. The 80s and 90s are two terrible decades for Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of growth. We'll show those plots in a couple minutes. Two terrible decades in terms of civil war. There was a very high rates of civil conflict and civil war. Uh, the HIV AIDS epidemic breaks out in the 1980s and spreads in the 90s. These were terrible decades for African development. But what you start seeing at the very tail end of the period after 2000, you start seeing a pretty steep decline in extreme poverty in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that has continued over time. So actually, extreme poverty is falling now quite rapidly in Sub-Saharan Africa. They're finally joining in this trend um, that China and India started a few decades earlier. Okay, what other patterns do you guys see in this, in this figure that are, that are noteworthy? I will say one thing about data. India has extremely good data. Even way back into the colonial period, they have nationally representative household surveys, firm surveys, farmer surveys, even school surveys, just going back 100 years. So the Indian data is actually probably very reliable here, more reliable than either the African data or the Chinese data. And you can kind of see, you know, one way that statisticians and people that look at administrative data gauge how much measurement error there is in the data is just how much it bounces around. You can kind of see here the Chinese data is kind of bouncing around even over the course of a few years. And the Indian data is just moving with these really smooth trends, which probably means it's more accurate. But yeah, there's a hand up. So what you're saying is the population increased a lot. So even though the proportion living in poverty fell, the total number living in poverty is still very large. So part of what you're saying is true in the sense that you know Chinese population in the 80s was, or in the 70s was much smaller. Um, so even though they've cut the proportion of people living in poverty, there's still hundreds of you know 100 million people or 200 million people living in poverty. So that's definitely true. Um, now that said, given population growth of a certain amount, you want to cut the proportion of living in extreme poverty as much as you could. So basically, because of the Chinese experience with China being the world's most populous country, because of the reduction in poverty in China, total global poverty has fallen. That's been the biggest driver of the reduction in global poverty, and India as well has played a role. Um, so despite um, what you're saying, the reduction in poverty has been so strong that the absolute number of poor is still falling in China, but not as quickly as if their population were stable. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think anybody believes these data for China. Even today, there's so much debate among academics about Chinese data because the fear is so much of it is rigged that there's a lot of political incentives to manipulate statistics. And of course, there's no free press to sort of check government statistics. Um, so you know, the absence of a sort of democratic environment and a free media means the government can play with data. And it's not just in China. There's many countries around the world where there are accusations of governments manipulating data. For instance, in Argentina, this has been like a huge issue for the last decade. But given the growing importance of China and the global economy, investors and researchers are increasingly upset that they feel like they can't believe a lot of the Chinese data. Now, at least today, there's enough firm-level data and household data that the data is of better quality. But back in the 80s, these numbers are kind of guesstimates, I would say. 
Um, so, but there's been you know, endless debates about the quality of data. It's also a lot harder to run your own survey in China. So in India or in Africa, when I've done research, you, know, you meet with government officials, you show them your survey, and 99.9% .9 of the time, unless you're doing something crazy, your survey's approved. You, you collect the data you want to collect. But the process in China, because it is so much more politically repressive, is much harder. There's a lot of sensitive topics. I can't just show up and start asking about land seizures or you know, our local government officials benefiting from corrupt land seizures. You can't do that in China. You can totally do it in India. You can just go run surveys on these things. So, so I think you know, there are questions about the data. That said, there's no doubt the reduction in poverty has been the most rapid in world history. I mean, it's an incredible economic story. Um, but, but there are questions about the data. Yeah. To reduce poverty. <laughs> so there, there have been big reductions in poverty in the US. In terms of sort of modern economic data, the farther back you go in time, the less reliable the data is. And we didn't really have modern expenditure surveys and other things, um, you know, say at the beginning of our republic, right? We didn't have that kind of data. Over time, the data's gotten better. So once you get to about the period of the Civil War on, there's actually pretty good data for the US. But even at that point, the US was, was much richer than China, India, and Sub-Saharan Africa in 1980. So we just, we, you know, so part of the reason why Africa's poor today is because they haven't grown the last 50 years. Part of it, they started really, really poor. So the sort of wealthy North American and European countries, even 150 years ago, had much higher per capita incomes than these countries in 1980. So they have a long hill to climb. You know, as I mentioned before, even China with its unbelievable growth rates, it's going to take many, many decades to catch up to the US in per capita income. Um, we're going to come to that. So in a few weeks when we talk about geography and sort of long-term uh, growth trends in Africa, we're going to come to exactly this issue of, of how colonial settlement may have played a role uh, in different parts of the world. Let me just hold off on that, but you're on to something that we're going to come back to in like two weeks. And then at the end of the course, when we talk about colonial economic policy, we'll come back to it again. So there's kind of deep historical reasons for what's going on, and we're going we're to gradually get there. OK, any other comments? Yeah. It's, poverty rates have definitely gone down. I'll show you the growth rates. So we have better growth data than poverty data, because again, for the poverty data, you need this very fine-grained household data to really get at poverty. But I'll show you the growth rates in a few slides, and you'll see African growth is sort of faster than it's been. And so um, the data we do have for particular countries, like Kenya, a country we'll talk about a lot, is poverty rates are falling rapidly right now. So, so Afri African countries are beginning to make this transition now. Okay, so population has come up with some of the questions. So I want to just put up a slide. This, this, these numbers are in your reader as well um, with some other statistics. Now, should I turn the lights off again? Can you guys not see this? It's hard to see. It's hard to see? Okay. I forget which one it was. Ah, good. I remembered. Um, so what we have here is total population in 2012. Sub Saharan Africa is about 800 million. You can see that East Asia is almost 2 billion. Once you count in China and other East Asian countries, you know, Indonesia has hundreds of millions of people. Vietnam has almost 100 million people, et cetera. So we're at about 2 billion there. And South Asia is at about 1.7 billion. So these are the three most populous uh, developing regions. Latin America is pretty big, but you know, as you'll see, um, Next, they're going to be growing by a lot less than the other regions over time. The prediction is by 2030, African population is going to grow a lot. So Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa's population is going to grow by 40 or 50% just over the next 20 years. Um, whereas in other regions, say East Asia Pacific, there's going to be a much smaller increase. And South Asia is going to have a pretty rapid increase. I'm going to show you this graphically in a second. But you can see Sub-Saharan Africa is catching up in terms of population. And the reason why is their per capita population growth is really fast, 2.5%. There's much higher rates of uh, fertility, meaning number of children born per woman, in Sub-Saharan Africa than other regions. Of course, we know that in East Asia, there are very low rates, and that's really driven by the one-child policy in China. So starting in the late 70s, China institutes a very strict one-child policy. Fertility falls. And what you basically have is very small uh, cohorts, so meaning birth cohorts, of young people relative to working-age people today in China. Because if the one-child policy is followed, then for every two adults who have children, you only have one child. So you have a, a shrinking of population over time. Um, in South Asia, so in India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, there's actually also been uh, a very rapid reduction in fertility. Not quite to East Asian levels, but much less fertility than in Sub-Saharan Africa. So more like 1.6 or 1.4 percent. It's falling over time. So the prediction is fertility is going to keep uh, keep falling. The prediction as to what we have, uh, you know, right now is fertility rates aren't really falling much in Sub-Saharan Africa. Maybe only a little bit. They just remain very high. So Africa is going to grow as, as a share of the world's um, population. These patterns and these policies, like the one-child policy, have generated really big differences in the distribution of ages in these countries. So in East Asia, the median person, the person sort of right at the 50th percentile in terms of age, is in their 30s already. So that's relatively old for a poor country. That's more like a rich country. In Sub-Saharan Africa, the median age is still a teenager. It's still 18 or 19, meaning half the population is 18 or below, and half is 18 or above. So when you really look at the youth of humanity and the future of humanity, it's in Sub-Saharan Africa. There just aren't that many young people in, say, many Asian countries relative to African countries. A lot of Asian countries' populations are going to start shrinking very rapidly, really following the trend of Japan. Japanese population peaked something like 15 or 20 years ago and is now shrinking very rapidly. Japanese population was close to, I think, 130 million, 125, 130 million, and now it's closer to 110 million. Just been this like, very rapid decline. Chinese population, and I'll show you a figure, is going to follow a very similar pattern, while African populations are, are booming. So the median age is one useful way of seeing this. Actually, here, sorry, the median age yeah, is 32 in East Asia. You can see over the course of a decade, the median age went up by four years. The other interesting statistic is what's called the dependency ratio. The, de the best way to think about the dependency ratio is the number of very young and very old people divided by working